we have this thing with pastor stephanie and and since we've been working with her for some time we want to continue to do our best for them and help them as much as we can in this time of need that they have so we do know that they're both up in heaven having a good time but at the same time they said that uh yeah it still takes a while to get over the loss even though they kind of knew they were in bad shape so it just takes some time and we just keep praying for them and we praise god and thinking about that, I talked with Cheryl Scribner here a while back and asked how she was doing. She says she's hanging in there. The ministry's going good, and she's still, uh, you know, getting over losing her husband as well. So we might keep lifting her up, keeping her going. She said that there was somebody that had a um, a vision. Actually, there's been two people have had visions, and he's been sitting in this place where there's all kinds of books, and Jesus is sitting behind him, and he's getting all of his answers <laughs> that he needed, and you know, all the questions he's had answered. So <laughs> he's he's having a good time. <laughs> so <laughs> one of these days we'll be able to do that. So we get all our answers. Uh, there are all the questions that we have answered. So praise the Lord. I just give God glory on that. Along with that, you know. That's exactly what I was going to talk about today, but that's fine. The fact is, you know, we were going to go because of the weather was bad Thursday, supposedly. But, I mean, it was amazing. Every time we looked at the map or the, the radar, nothing. Not a thing. But it missed it all the way over. It was a light mist. It was just cloudy, gloomy, and a mist. But we didn't realize about the temperature was going to drop that low either because I didn't think it was supposed to. So, and I've also, when we went over there, we got about Walnut, and all of a sudden we've seen a highway patrol car with a sign on the back. It was like a, a banner. It said, Hazard Ahead. I've never seen that before in my life with the lights going. And that's when we found out that's when a few trucks and, ro and cars were in the, in the ditch at that time because it was starting to change the, into ice. We are building ice up on our car. That's when Sarah said we should be going back home. And you know, wonder if we should go home. We're so close, and like she said, didn't feel like we needed to, so we went. I had prayed, and the Lord said he'd be fine getting there and getting back, so I wasn't too worried about it. But on the way back, like she said, by the time we got there, uh, we went to um, Texas Roadhouse and ate. It was a good good food and good service but when we got out it was about 8 30 that night not thinking it'd be quite that late because we didn't think we'd be all that traffic and everything and the, the ice slowing us down a little bit but we took off and sarah's watching the road and there's this one section just as you start to turn back and come back east off of 80 you know 80 kind of comes up and then bends back from there until Atlantic, it was supposed to be 100% ice covered, and the trucks weren't out putting any salt down. So we were going along there, and we are watching the trailers. And what I do is I watch the trailers to make sure there's water coming off their tires. If you see water coming off their tires, it's not totally ice yet. Doesn't mean you can't have a little icy stuff here and there, but you're pretty well in good shape. Also, we some places we're hearing this whoosh, whoosh, slosh underneath our tires. <clears throat> underneath our car which gave us a chance to know we were kicking up water as well so it wasn't that bad but that one section the truck went by and there was no water so i knew we were in trouble <coughs> again just trusting god and we pulled into a truck stop there because there had to be a pit stop and we pulled up there and pulled in the, pit, in the truck stop it was all ice pulled in in front of the the uh, convenience store there all ice they slid all the way into the convenience store and slid all the way back to the car so we said wow this isn't going to be good so we took off we went out we got over a ways uh, past a was a, a dare <coughs> excuse me then all of a sudden when we were there i was going to pull off for another pit stop in a, in a truck stop or the rest area I pulled off and I found out it was really icy and I kind of got up we were kind of were going up a hill and then you have to pull up another little you know, sl you know area just to pull into the parking lot and I, I pulled up and I kind of stopped 
And I looked and I says, you guys aren't getting out. This is all ice, all the way through there. No way. So all of a sudden I started to just kind of keep on trying to go forward, back out, because I never really pulled into the parking lot. I just kind of pulled at an angle. And all of a sudden the car goes, slides sideways. Not up the hill, sideways. So I stopped. And about that time, Brendan was petrified in the back. And I says, okay. So then I, I kind of took it again and tried it. And one more slide sideways. And it's coming right over by this semi. We had some room there. So I stopped and I thought about this a little bit. I says, your tires are hot. And if you sit long enough, it'll kind of melt that ice off. Because it wasn't that thick of an ice. So I sat there for a little while. And I finally went to take off again. And it, it didn't want to go. But it didn't slide sideways after that time. So I let it set there, and I, I kind of made sure I didn't slide sideways, but I just let it kind of slowly move, which was what what's doing is heating up and burning the ice off again. So finally I stopped, and I waited a little bit for it to get figured out there, and all of a sudden I let it out, and all of a sudden it just started to hit it some gravel or something, you know, just some concrete, and it took off. It didn't go fast. We just went real slow, but we did get out of that part, you know, out of the, it was amazing we could have got out of it with that much ice there, but it was gone. He was watching over us. And then we got down to uh, over the past Atlantic, and they would salted the roads, and things were good, and water was going, but that was, it was about to Stewart when all of a sudden there was a semi that came up behind us. I would kept watching in the mirror, and I, I'm seeing this guy, and he's coming down barreling fast. And he was not getting over to the left lane. He was still in our lane, so I eventually start pulling off the side. And I said, move over, move over. And eventually, right before he got to us, he moved over and went around us. But, I mean, it was like, this is crazy. And then we had the second truck, and I didn't tell anybody. It was doing the same thing, but it did. It was waiting quite a while before it got over in the left lane before it went around us because it was. But that one could have, if I wasn't watching, it could have been in bad shape. Then we got to Stewart, and we stopped there for a pit stop, and it was nice everything was off the salt was you know was working no ice then we came on home that night so we got to thinking hmm i guess we shouldn't have gone after all but it was just because rain didn't wasn't any problem and there was no clouds that was the amazing part about it. every time we look at the radar nothing some of it was in des moines some of it went through omaha before we got there but then it went north and we we're thinking what is this so the the thing is you have to continue praying all the time for everything for protection of what's going on i know people have asked and i'm thinking well i'm trying to wait and just tell everybody at one time so we you know, don't have to go over the, the long details of everything that happened but that's what was happening but uh, we only did that simply because the roads were supposed to be better on wednesday we could all do it and we thank karen for wanting to do or willing to do the the uh, family fellowship that night even though that didn't happen either it sounds like so <laughs> It's one of those deals. It's just weather. It's something those things. But messing with ice like that is not good. So praise the Lord. I took in the Saturday. I woke up. Praise God. Another miracle. You know, people they say miracles never work. But every morning, if you get up, you got a miracle. You don't have to check the obituaries to find out if your name's in there. So praise the Lord. That's a blessing. That's a miracle. And I, as I was getting up, this scripture was on my mind. Matthew nine sixteen through 17. And who would patch an old garment and unshrunk clothes for the patch shrinks and pulls away from the old clothes, leaving an even bigger hole than, uh, than before? Now I'll put it this way. When we lived in northwest Iowa, we were poor. We were making some money. We were getting our bills paid off, but we didn't have a whole lot of extra. Through that process, we took and Debbie made everything. She made my pants, made my shirt, made her blouses and pants, and and uh, she even made suits for me. The only thing she didn't do was shoes because she wasn't a leather worker. She refused to do that. But anyway, the fact was it was pretty good. I mean, it's... It's nice to have the ability that in a, today's society, a lot of that's been lost. 
back then we used to take care of a lot of things had to do a lot of things differently but uh praise the lord we've got the ability to have good clothes and stores to go to and situations to happen and usually we have enough money to be able to do that so it's a blessing but back then they used to even darn socks those darn socks they got holes in them all the time you know i used to have long toenails and i wouldn't cut them off and i definitely had a hole in my sock all the time so you could darn those up sew them up and get them so you could keep on going of course when i grew up and at home it was the four kids and it was even a little bit different that's when you wear your shoes out and you put cardboard in your shoes to keep the water from going through the holes in your foot. And probably some people have had that happen before too. I don't have to do that, praise the Lord. Come close sometimes, but I didn't have to do that. It gets hard if you don't have something there because your ball of your foot's touching the ground all the time. It causes a problem. So we are so blessed in this season. What's happening, what's going on. Sometimes we want to take that for granted. Granted. But uh, we're definitely blessed. I took in, uh, it goes on to say in 17, and no one puts new wine in old wineskin, and the old skin would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skin. New wine must be stored in the new wineskin. That's why both the wine and the wineskins are, or that way, both the wine and the wineskins are preserved, and that's NLT. I'm going to put it this way. I've talked about this. I've heard about it most of my life as a Christian. But I never really took a whole lot of looking at it to see exactly what it means. And I, that's what I talked about here a while back. What was it? I touched on it. And I says, Lord, you know, we're in, in a process of change. A process of moving into the next season. And I was, I was waking up and I was thinking about that. And I said, Lord, what's going on? He says, I want you to make sure they understand what it means. Maybe you do have an understanding. Praise the Lord. This is what I'm just hearing from the Lord. So I said, okay. I'll go back through there. So I started to look at some other articles to find out because I've said what I've said. But I just wanted to see what other people were thinking and how they were coming up and maybe I'd have a little different way of saying what was going on. So through that, I came up with the Pharisees were threatened by the popularity of Jesus and his ways. They seem to them to be against the law, even though we know that Jesus lived a perfect life and fulfilled the law. So first they want to talk about the Pharisees, the religious people. Didn't like what he was doing or didn't accept that uh, they were losing ground and people were following Jesus instead of what they were teaching. And it came up with a saying which I really believe is so important today. Jesus invited us into a relationship with him. So why do we often worry about our religious practices more than simply being in relationship with God? You might say, I don't have any religious practices. But if you've been trained in a religious church which you'll be realized there's things in you that are still there you're still thinking you still understand it that way there are still uh, ways that you have believed them to be true when I came out of the Dutch Reformed Church they didn't believe in the Holy Spirit didn't believe healing was today believed that when the disciples died it was over with when the Lord started to take me out of that and start to send me through my walk with him, because I said, I opened my heart, opened my mind. I said, but I'm not going to believe anything unless I know it's of you. So it took a while to really search things out, because I heard a lot of stuff. 
things that I didn't believe were true because of my religious teachings. And finally I got to a place After 10 years of the Lord taking me through, I finally got rid of most of my religious teachings. It took me 10 years. Because it's ingrained in you. It's something locked onto you. That's why you know, we talk with people and we, we, they're saying, well, they're, they're going here, they're not believing this or not believing that, they're, they're doing this or doing that, and I'm thinking, okay, Go back to the scriptures and it says, under the anointing, the yokes are destroyed. The yokes are the teachings. That's what happened. That's what we found out about that one video was given to me that in the old days, the rabbis, the teacher of the law, would find people, young men, that would bring them in and they would train them up. And when they trained them up, that was their teaching. That was their university back then. You'd say it today, a university through their teaching, whatever they taught, whether it was right, wrong, or indifferent, it was their teaching, and you had to follow their teaching. If you look at a denomination, they take you through a seminary. They do the same thing. They teach you what they believe, right, wrong, or indifference. It's what they teach, and you need to stay within that perimeter of what they teach because if you don't, then they'll kick you out. See, this is why we... What what happened was for years the Lord showed me all these things. I said, you know, not my will but yours. What do you want, Father? And he started showing me all these things. I didn't know how to put it together structure-wise. That's when I was into World Ministry Fellowship and we got the book, Apostolic Cell Church. When I did that, they said that the pastor was a, a Baptist pastor that grew up in a Baptist church. He wanted to go to college. So they sent him, they paid his way through his college, came back, he was very dynamic, and he started to build their church up. He grew the church pretty good sized, doing great, fantastic. One day he got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Biggest thing happened was he'd been teaching people against the Holy Ghost. He had taught them so well, well that when he was able to say something, they got mad and kicked him out. He's gone. That's when he said that the Lord said, I'm giving you a new thing. So he gave him another Baptist church, which was a smaller church. So he came in, and I'm sure he had some major problems because when you come in and you try to change the theology around in the church, it's like the Dutch pastor that was in our church, that youth pastor, and he says, how many Dutchmen does it take to change the light bulb? Change! Ooh, change is the worst thing to be possible. You don't always want to change. You're so used to doing things the way you've done it. And this is what it comes down to. When you start to have done so many things for so long, you start to think that way. So that becomes your understanding. It's persuasion. When you're so persuaded that this is right, it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. It's going to be what you believe is right because you're persuaded. That's what happens. That's the yokes that come on people's life and necks. That's what happens when all of a sudden you start to move. And, and if there's a, somebody who grew up in a religious understanding, which is legalism and traditions, what happens immediately, the enemy grabs that yoke and pulls on it. You go to this way, trying to break away and do what the Lord wants to do, and they grab the devil grabs it and pulls them back and say, uh-uh, you can't do this, you can't do that, so they pull you right back in to the place where you're supposed to be. So you can't do what God wants you to do. That's why it says it breaks the yokes. It breaks your teaching. Then Jesus says, you can put my yoke on. His yoke is light, which is the kingdom of God and the understanding of the kingdom of God and the freedom that he's received through these things. It's kind of like what we've known already, but still, if you're going through and you still have some of those areas from your upbringing, your teaching that you had from the other denominations, then you have to take and break them. Now, one thing with a book that I ran across, he said many times, the Lord wanted a new thing. But the problem was this. 
He says, every time we tried to do something, it wasn't working. I wouldn't get it to go. All of a sudden, they, had, they wanted to go back and do the same thing they did before because it worked. I've talked to people before, and, and some guys were, this one guy was a pastor that I had respect for. I told him what I was going to do. He says, it won't work. They've tried it. It will not work. I'm thinking, God says it will. Maybe they didn't try it the same way God wanted it. I don't know. But this is what it's all about, these issues that you deal with in situations going on. It all comes from when, you know, and I've, I've dealt with this before about uh, the old wineskin and the new wineskin. I've come to a conclusion that you, have, you can have both. Your old wineskin is what you had from your teachings of religion and every the things that you've learned all through your life. That's the old wineskin. The old wine's in it. So what happens when you get baptized, you get saved, you ask Jesus Christ in your life, you become born again, you realize that on the cross, all of a sudden, he set us free, he made us one. He won. He destroyed the work of the enemy. He did it all. When he did that, what happened? We became born again. He made us a new wineskin. He made us a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to live in us. We are the new wineskin. Now there's physical and there's spiritual. And I believe our thinkings, our understanding, our teachings, the yokes that we've lived in from the things that we've come from in the past, which is teachings, are still the old wineskin. And many times we try to put the, old, the new wine in our old thinkings, and that's what happens. It comes down and it breaks out. Whereas if we start to bring it into the new wine skin and allow the Holy Spirit to move through us and teach us and understand what's going on. And that's what happened to me when I got out of the Dutch Reformed Church. I kept praying, I kept seeking, and God put me in places. Boy, he put us in a lot of places. But every time I went there, one guy said, you're going to raise people from the dead. I said, no, only Jesus could do that. That was my own wine skin. He was, he was believing it. You can do this, you can do that. No, you can't do this, can't do that. Jesus can only do that. My old wineskin. Constantly using my old wineskin. But I finally got to a place where I removed my old wineskin, my old thinkings, my own understanding, and removed it out and put in and started to trust the Lord with the new wineskin. So when the wine came in, when the revelation came in, when the understanding started to come in, I wasn't putting it in the old wineskin. I was putting it in the new wineskin. So I was maintaining and holding on to. I've seen many people, one guy in particularly in the Dutch Reformed Church, that's my cousin's husband. He got so anointed by the Holy Ghost in a meeting one time, he was wild for the Lord. He was praying for people. Things were happening. Everything was going on. People were getting upset with him. Didn't want him to do this. He was going to stay in the Dutch Reformed Church and get them flipped over because he knew the difference. Sorry to say, he stayed with the old wine skin. You can't put old wine skin or new wine in old wine skin because it'll bust out. Well, that's exactly what happened. About two years later, I seen him. He was down. He was out. He had no spirit left in him. I'm sure he was saved, the Spirit of God was in him, but the excitement he had, all the stuff that was going on, what he wanted to achieve was gone. He was sick and almost died. I'm thinking, oh my goodness. You can't put it in your understanding. You can't change the old wineskin. You cannot have to get rid of it. Now, I did say one time, because I had a person that had talked about it, and I have said it, I want to clarify that for sure. If you take an old wineskin, and they've talked about if you take it and soak it with oil and continually soak it, what it does, it can refurbish it enough to where it will hold new wine. 
that's why the holy spirit goes in and starts to work in denominations and everything else and starts to change that around that's why you're seeing some of the denominations start to go more towards the spirit of god and start to do some things everything else we were hearing about the revivals that are happening in these chapels found out it was three different churches three different domina dominations that it was at there's one what you know god didn't worry about denominations but again, if you stay in their thinking and understanding and won't let the Holy Spirit to move through you, you're going to have a problem. That's why you have to realize you have to renew your mind with the Word of God. That's why you're renewing your wineskin to bring the place where it can stay. You probably understand all this, but the Lord says I need to put it out, so that's why I'm putting this one out. See, the Pharisees were threatened by the popularity of Jesus. That's why they came against him. We have everything, or we have everything in him, which is God, and our works will flow out of our love for him. Another awesome, awesome understanding. We have everything in him. Either what do you need? What do you don't, what do you don't have through Jesus Christ, through the love of God, through everything that he's provided for us? And our works will flow out of our love for him. When you take and run across somebody that's trying to do it on their own, you'll say, wow, this isn't going to work very well. Why? Because you're not getting that to happen. But Ephesians 4, 3, starting with 2 and 3, I go back through that all the time. That is the new wineskin. Ephesians 4, as far as I'm concerned, is the kingdom of God is also the new wineskin. I put this in the New Living Testament. Humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's fault because of your love. Again, th it says, we have everything in him and our works flow out of our love for him. This is where it's at. If you don't have the love in, him, in your heart for him, your works aren't going to produce what really needs to be produced. I've watched that in some places where people aren't walking in love. They're just doing it because they have to or because they want to or because it has to be done. Sometimes in a smaller uh, setting you have to do that because you only have so many people. But the reality is when you do that it says also always keep yourself united in the Holy Spirit and bind yourself together with peace. Now to achieve those two things, it takes an act of God upon people. It takes an act of God to do that. In other words, people have to get so unified in the spirit. They have to learn how to love themselves so strong that no matter what happens, God will take care of what's happening. See, this is what it's about. This is the challenge that we have right now to bring people into that unity. Such a close unity to want what God wants, not what we want. To know what God wants, not what we want. To be in unity with the Holy Spirit. This is it. This is why the Lord has this place set up. It's not our will, it's God's will. And the more we start going that way, the more we start unifying, the more we start allowing, uh, making allowance for each and other's faults because of your love. In other words, somebody's going to do something and you'll just love them through it. You know, sometimes there's a tough love. You have to say things. But there's other times you just, just love them. Love will change everything. He changes the world. But if we don't have the love of God in us, if we haven't sought God in such a way, it comes down to the last commandment. I, I went through this, and the Lord, when I was getting ready, the Lord hit me with this thing. He says we always talk, or always heard a lot about Deuteronomy 28. It says, if you do these things that I command you, I will bless you. The blessings will come and overtake you. If you go back and look at the first part of it, 
It says, I'll bless your home, I'll bless your family, I'll bless your land, I'll bless your crops, I'll bless your work, I'll bless everything that you want, I'll bless the, you'll give you rain when you need to, your earth will produce, everything will work perfectly. Well, maybe not everything, because we live in this world, there's still sin and everything happens, but you will be blessed. That's why I always talk about the man that him and his wife, and it Four daughters went out and walked around the, the land because there was army worms coming around. He was a farmer. He came up to their land, turned, went up around the field, back down in the same place on the other side of the field, and right through the neighbors. Why? Because they were doing the Deuteronomy 28 first section. Then the guy that was a, a farmer up there in, in Wisconsin, a dairy farmer. They had people coming in. They had scientists coming in. They had people from the, you know, the dairy magazines because they were having calves, double, twins. I mean, they're having twin dairy cows, babies. that don't work that way very often. It does not, but every one was about twins. And they didn't put them normally when they get so old they can't keep them to nurse. There's a problem, a disease that happens. So they'd have to separate them, put them in a little hutch off to the side. He never did. They said, you can't do this. This don't happen. His herd was increasing. And the scientist was trying to figure out what was going on. And all of a sudden, he said, I could have told him. Deuteronomy 28, God is blessing me. He's doing that. It's all happening. I said, oh, my. Then I started thinking about, because I went back and looked at a little bit about a certain thing on, on one of the areas, and that the last part, from, I think it's from 15 or 16 on down, if you don't do those, guess what happens? Your land's cursed. Your children's cursed. Your home's cursed. Your job's cursed. You're going to have inflammation. You're going to have diseases. You're going to have all kinds of things going on. If you go back and look at you know, it's just good once in a while to sit down and go through the curses. Find out how many neighbors, friends, families, yourself have the curse. Then ask the Lord why. Find out what the purpose is. I kept saying, God, when I went through that the one time, I, I seen it says that it will give you inflammation. Oh, my goodness. He says, I'll put inflammation on you. I says, I'm in trouble. I must be doing something wrong. I got inflammation. Inflammation does what? Causes your sickness. It causes your pain. According to the medical society. I says, well, got something going on here. I got to figure out what's going on. And I started praying about that. I said, Lord, what is going on? I think I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. I said, why have I got inflammation? Because you said you put it on me, according to Deuteronomy 28. If I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. He said, it's not you. He said, it's the food suppliers. I says, huh? And he started to show me through different ways. One of the biggest inflammation getters is soybean. Soybeans allow the omega-6s to be high. If your omega-3s and omega-6s are out of order, the omega-6s get up and they start to cause inflammation and pain. I'm thinking, oh my goodness. It's not me, it's other people that are affecting my life. So I had to start to understand some of these things as the Lord started to show me some of those things that was going on by science. Because I was asking him and getting things going. So I, then I took and I said, okay, I have to change things around. But at the same time, you say that's Old Testament. I said it was Old Testament. Don't have to worry about that. Again, when we had the, the man that was here and he kept saying, you got to, Christians are not doing the law. That's all he talked about. Christians are not doing the law. I said, that's old Old wineskin. The law is old wineskin. I didn't know. Again, God had to teach me. Because I ran across an article and it says, in the law, there's three parts to it. One of them is the ceremonial. The other one is the sacrificial. 
And the last one was the moral law. And he kept talking about, no, Christians, I said, we don't have to do sacrifice. No, I'm not talking about sacrifice. I said, we don't have to do, you know, the other one. They said, no, I'm not doing it. I'm talking about moral law. I said, moral law? Didn't understand because, see, I've not been trained that way. I did not understand what he was doing. Somebody had trained him. Somebody had taught him. I had not understood that. And I was sitting there, and he kept saying, oh, get out of the law. We'd be sitting in the family fellowship. He had uh, somebody read about the law one time. Well, we're not doing the law. No, everybody's getting up, well, getting up kind of upset because we don't have to do the law anymore. Misunderstandings. See, we think he was pulling out of the old wineskin. No, that's not it. What he was saying was the, the people, Christians, do not do the Ten Commandments anymore. That's the moral law. He was right. He was hitting that. You know, we come against each other. We, we lie against each other. We do things against each other, you know. We don't always love the Lord that God with all our hearts. And, and that's what was happening. He was saying these things. And I'm thinking... I finally got through to him one night. We were, I mean, he came in quite often in the evening, late. We'd be here, and we'd sit there, and we'd talk to him, go through him, and go through discipleship, and then he changed everything over to what he wanted to do and talk about what was going on. I learned what he was talking about, and I said, you know, you're right. All you have to do is say, instead of the law, just say the Ten Commandments. But he couldn't get through his, his understanding to say the Ten Commandments, because it was the moral law. It was all it was, was the moral law. See, that's that unity, coming together, loving each other so much to tell us the truth. He was telling me what he was believing was the truth. I accepted through my love for him. I took all my time to work with him to figure out exactly what he was talking about. I could have condemned him and said, no, I'm not going to have you in this place because I'm not going to have somebody stand up here and talk about the law. Now, I did tell him don't stand up and talk about it when you're standing here on the, van, you know, on the, on the works time. But the fact is I'm willing to find out and, and, and see what people are saying. But the Lord said many years ago, I said, that's the Old Testament. I says. I know it's still in effect because it's the same yesterday, today, and forever, but I says it's got to be different because we're not under the law because the commandments back then was a sacrificial and everything else that went along with that. And I says, okay. So then I went back down, and the Lord said, what's the new commandment I gave you? What's the new commandment I gave you? Okay. See, God gave that to Moses for that time period because there was a sin nature in people. But Jesus died on the cross to remove all of our sin nature, took all the sin, put it on him, went down in and took our sin nature away and gave us a new, brand new spirit with Christ. We're a new person. All old things are passed away. All things become new. We got new. We got a new wine skin we got new wine we don't have to go through the old stuff but it it's the same yesterday today and forever well we can get ourselves all caught up in that understanding and teachings but no it's different but it's the same because what happened was he said you know i went back and looked up he says i give you a new commandment to love the lord thy god with all thy heart all thy soul all thy mind the second is like it love thy neighbor as thyself and i went back and i started to see the very first section of that was the first part of the Ten Commandments. The second part was the second part of the Ten Commandments. Love thy neighbor as thyself. It doesn't actually print it out as the Ten Commandments, but if you understand the Ten Commandments at all, that's what that covenant is all about, that he made with us. But it's done by love. But the new one was done, or the old one was done by obedience. You know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You do it to me, I'm going to get back on you. I'm going to revenge you. It's not that way today. He even says, if you hate your brother without a cause, you're in danger of hellfire. Whoops. Just hate your brother. He says, if I look at a woman and lust after her, I've done it. Whew. That's a little different than back there in the back. 
in the Old Testament. There's things that have changed. But there's still some situations in people's lives because we've been taught so much, it's still the old wineskin. And if we're trying to put the new wine in the old wineskin, it'll break. It'll fall apart. That's why I like to work with people who have never had any religion. It's easier because you can just teach them the truth and they accept it and go down the road. Because there is some things happening that we have to work through. If they're working through it, it doesn't matter. They'll get through and make it fine and, and be okay. But I'm just saying that's what was happening. And it went on to say that Jesus not come to patch Jerusalem with a new piece of cloth. He came to fulfill Jerusalem. Jesus came to redeem, not plug holes. Whew. Well, I'll come here and I'll fix this so we can have a good thing going. No, he didn't do that. He raced it all. It's gone. Old is gone. New is in. Old is gone. New is in. Why is the old gone? It was sin nature because of Adam's sin. It's gone. He didn't come to plug a hole. He came to give you brand new. He came down, he says, I, and you know what it says, if you are in Christ, all things are new. You're a new creation in Christ. All things are new. Old things have passed away. You have to realize that. It's the process of your thinking, understanding, and knowing what you're going through. Yes, we still have to do the moral law. Ten Commandments. It's still there. It has not changed. The only thing that's changed back then, it was you had to be obedient to it. You had to do it because of you were required to do it. If you didn't, you got cursed. Today, it's you have to do it. You don't have to do it. He gives you the ability to love Jesus so much in yourself. You're going to do it to other people. The difference is spirit, physical or spiritual. You do it through the Spirit of God. You do it through the love. That's why I put down it's so important. Making an allowance for each other's fault because of your love. Always keep yourself united in the Holy Spirit and bind yourself together with peace. Bind yourself together with peace. Are you bound up with peace with everybody? Are you at peace with everybody this here? All your family members, you're in peace with them, right? You never look at anybody's faults because you love them so much you want to see them through God's eyes. If you don't get this, I'll tell you, God's, oh man, I don't want to tell you what I'm hearing right now. But the Holy Ghost is just hitting me hard. He's serious. He says, I'm not putting up much longer. I'm not putting up with it much longer. That's all I'll say at the present time. I'm sensing it strong in my spirit. Wow. God's serious. Time short. Time to get things done. It's got to get done. And all I can do is it's got you and me and all the other people in the body of Christ. We're his hands, we're his feet. Yes, he can spiritually come down and do whatever he wants to do. But he still needs us. I knew today was going to be different. But in Matthew 15, 38, it describes how the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The curtain was the barrier between God and the priest who approached him in the Holy of Holies. See, this is the old. This was the old. In the old, you had to bring a sacrificial lamb or dove or whatever else, bull, whatever you had, whatever was required at that time. You had to take it to a priest. Take it to the temple. Or you could do it depending on the law, what it was supposed to set up to. And then the priest had to deliver that before the, the, the presence of God, once a year especially, in the temple. There was a division between man and the Holy Spirit, between man and God. It was a physical curtain. Jesus didn't come to fix the curtain. 
to straighten it up, to work better, to do something different. He did one thing. When he hung on the temp on the cross, he said this, or it says this, his flesh became the veil. His flesh, see he was a temple. He was the temple. The flesh became the veil. And God ripped it from top to bottom. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Now, you might say, I'm not worth going into the heavens. I used to say that. I can't go into heaven. I used to back in. Because I didn't feel good enough to go in before the presence of God. I used to back in. But the Lord said, he showed me eventually, I don't see your sin. I see the blood of Jesus. It's the only way you can go into the presence of God. That's why the, the, the veil was there. God could not be around the sins of the people. Old Testament. But he made a way he could be amongst the people in the inner, the holy holies, in the temple. Because he wanted to bless the people. He wanted to change the people. He wanted to have a relationship with the people. He wants it today to have a relationship with you. Not just, well, Lord, thank you for this. Thank you. I need this. I need. No, he wants to have a relationship. He wants to talk to you. He wants to tell you his heart. His heart. This is what it's about. That's what he wants to do. And then all of a sudden, when he ripped that and the blood of Jesus went and washed us clean as he took all the sins upon him. Think about that. Now we can enter boldly into the throne room because we're washed with the blood. He doesn't see our sins. He sees the blood of Jesus. It's the only way you can enter. And when you can enter, then guess what? You can sit with him. Sit beside him. Talk with him. Work with him. Ask what's going on. That's what it's about. That's what God's waiting for. If you haven't done it, you need to do it. It works. It's awesome. Also, Old Testament, I've talked about this before. It was in the Old Testament, Second Chronicles 5, 4, no, 13 and 14. At that moment, a cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their work because of the glory presence of the Lord Filled the temple of God. Filled the temple of God. People sit around. I have changed some songs before. And the reason is exactly this understanding. Jesus said. That's old wineskin. Old wineskin. When you start to pray, Lord, fill this temple, fill this place. I love those songs. It's awesome. I can sit in there and just get into the groove of those songs. But it's old wineskin. Why? It's talking about in the old, about filling the temple. But what happened when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration? What happened? When he had three disciples, all of a sudden he started to shine. Why was he shining? The glory was in him. From the day he was born, he had the glory of God in him because he was received. You know, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He had the Holy Spirit all the way through. He is the temple. He had the glory. Why are we sitting here? Oh, fill this temple with your glory when you're already filled. Let it come out of you. Amen. Don't let it sit there. There's so much inside of you. If you just released it, I'll tell you what, this place would shine. We'd have the Shekinah glory in here if people would let go and let it go and let it happen. That's what this is all about. I'm thinking, wow, that's awesome, Lord. 
This is fantastic. It said that Jesus removed the barrier between God and human, uh, the human beings by his sacrifice on the cross. Jesus removed the barrier between God and humans, mankind, by a sacrifice on the cross. I'm just praying what the Lord wants to really go through this thing here because God's getting serious. There are some things coming. Of course, it doesn't matter if you hear him here or you hear him up in heaven. I'd rather hear him here than have him up in heaven. I'll put it this way. We're praying on Thursday at 3 p.m. And last Thursday, the anointing hit me. We have about 20 minutes of music, 20 minutes of prayer, and 20 minutes of proclaiming. In the middle of the prayer, the end of the prayer, the Holy Ghost hit me. And I start praying in the Holy Ghost like crazy. I start having a vision. There was a time in my life that I would not say what I'm going to say. I know it. I've understood it. But I just sit back and let it go. But I got to say what I got to say. And I want to say it in such a way that you understand the way I was told by the Holy Spirit what I'm going to say. Because there's a miscommunication can cause great grief and I do not want that. So I'm being very, very cautious. That's why I wouldn't normally say it. But the Lord gave it to me. And this is exactly what he was saying so please listen carefully if you have a misunderstanding please talk to me about it because I don't want to be too misunderstood I heard the Lord ask me it was in the spirit what happened when a football team gets a touchdown everybody jumps up and screams and hollers and goes crazy That's what I said. What happens when the team wins? They run onto the field. They get excited. They, they party all night long. Why? Because they won. It was something important to them. It gave them something to do. Now this is the part that I want you to totally understand what the Lord gave me without making, I don't want to get anybody to have a misunderstanding. He said this, but when you talk about me hanging on the cross, when I won, defeated the devil, what do they do? Anybody jump up? Anybody scream? Anybody say, praise God? We become so dormanted or, under, or, or down to a place of so docile that we can't even get excited about God and what we're teaching while you're hearing something in the scripture. I know we've never really put a whole lot of issue. Now, I, might have, I don't want to upset anybody or cause any problems. But I'll tell you what, if you don't start getting excited when something comes up, that, that we should be excited about. If this was a football game, I'll tell you, everybody would be up screaming, hollering, and going crazy right now. That's what the Lord said. They'd all be standing up screaming, hollering, and going crazy. Why? Because they won. Jesus won for you. See, finally got some hallelujahs out of this. See, the difference is we're so, wow, we're so used to it. God's saying, I'm going to stir people up. He said the reason I went to those chapels, the temples, when I released my anointing, he says, 
And they, and my understanding was not because anybody was there or anything was happening. He says it's because those people will take it out and tell people about me. And I said, whoa. And after I got through here, Oh, shit about on that about anybody getting a word I'll tell you there's a word coming because I I put down here I was going to put out something and all of a sudden I just put a bunch of dots saying God's going to fill in this spot I don't know what's going to happen I just know God's going to speak so if you got something let me know and we'll let you speak got the power that's right got the power yep but I actually seen, and this is what the Lord showed me in a vision, of people standing there in a grocery store. Did you realize what Jesus did? did? He won it for us at the cross. He won it. What would happen if you had a football team and you were standing by somebody and you start saying, did you, see, do you, you, you watch this football team? Do you see what's going on? I, I'm just a bad because I don't do that. But the the Lord is saying he's needing some cheerleaders. He needs some fans out here that are going to stand up and say and do some things like he's never had happen before. Yes. I put it this way. Like I said, I would never come through this and say this in this way, but I'll tell you what. He said it's time to get excited. It's time to turn around and say hallelujah, praise God. When you start to hear something that excites you about God, stand up and shout. Don't be moderate and don't just sit there. Oh, well, this is just one of those meetings. No, God's here. Jesus is looking. Angels are writing everything down. Writing your attitude. He's writing everything that's happening. Whether you're involved in what's going on or you're not involved in what's going on. He's taking it right directly up to the heavens to be put in the book of remembrance. And it'll be used against us down the road. If we have things lined up, we'll be fine. I'm just telling you, when I was in that worship like that, it would just blew me away. I'm thinking, this is whew, something I really don't want to say. But that's what he said. Then he said one more thing, and I want you to be totally careful and understand exactly what I was hearing, and I want to put it across the best I possibly can so there's no misunderstanding. I said on Thursday, 3 o'clock, we have a prayer. I was sitting there. I was looking around. I said, Lord, it would be nice to have some more people here. And this is exactly what I heard. If the people do not want to be here, I don't want them here. Amen. If the people don't want to be here, I don't want them here. Doesn't mean he doesn't want you to come to church. I'm talking about the prayer meeting Thursday at 3 o'clock. And I'm going to explain what he meant by that. Then he reminded me this, and I went back to where he reflected back to the final quest. A little history again. Final quest was uh, Rick Joyner. And what he did was, you got a word? No, I know, you're just holding your hand up, <laughs> letting the blood flow down. Sorry about that. But Rick Joyner was there, and, and he had this vision, and he was where this hordes of hell was coming at him, and the people on the first level of this mountain of God was salvation, and he went down and grabbed him and pulled him on to salvation. And you can go back and read the book. It talks about that. And then he realized he could climb up to different levels. And he kept climbing up to different levels. And every level there was arrows there that he could take and shoot at the enemy. He says the problem was he was shooting an enemy. And he would shoot at the person because the demons were riding on the people. The arrows would go to the people and not the demon because of what was happening. And the people would get even madder. So then he climbed a little bit higher and a little bit higher. And, and the enemy could shoot at him. He got high enough where the enemy couldn't shoot at him anymore. It was called the unity of the brethren. 
I'm going to tell you God's heart right now. He wants people on that level. The unity of the brethren. That's why he said, if they don't want to be here, I don't want them. If they aren't going to come here in unity and believe and understand, I cannot move, saith the Lord. I cannot do what I want to do if there is no unity of the brethren. It'll hinder and give the authority to the devil through the division that is there. There will be problems that are going on. Does that mean God doesn't want you? No. It means we have a work of getting people into that place or you have a work to become into unity of the brethren, to understand what God wants, to walk in the unity and the love of the Holy Spirit. That's what it's about. And I sit there and I'm saying, wow. And this is what it said. It was called safety. It's in uh, the final quest. You can read it. When we reach the level called the unity of the brethren, none of the enemy armies could reach us. Many in our camp decided it was too far as they needed to, as, you know, too far as they needed to climb. In other words, they couldn't climb. They didn't want to climb that far because it was too hard. Many people get to that place. If you are, that's where you're at. That's where you're at. You don't have to climb up there. That's another thing, Lord. Got to get rid of. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So anyway, but going that way, he said that I understood this because with each new level, the footing was very precarious. It got tougher and tougher and tougher. He says, however, I always felt much stronger and more skillful with my weapon the higher I went. So I continued climbing. Soon my skills were good enough to shoot and hit the demon without hitting the Christian. This is what we need to do. Many times our words are accusing people and they're hitting the Christian and causing problems. But if we get high enough and we start taking and we come in after the devil because we're in unity of the brethren, we're not coming against the brethren, we're allowing for the, uh, the faults of because we have the love of God in such a way because we're hooked up with God and other people in the body of Christ. This is what it's about. It's not about a meeting. It's not about church. It's not about whatever's going on in your life. It's about getting close to God, realizing what's God, one day you will stand before God one way or the other in judgment or you'll be when you go to heaven with a rapture. I mean, it's just up to you what you want to do. It's how you want to do it. It's what's going on. It's part of what's happening right now. There is a, t a pulling back and forth. There's a pulling back and forth. The enemy is trying to pull you away from God even worse now than he ever had before simply because he doesn't want you. He knows he's losing the battle with the unity of the body. That's what has to happen. The unity of the body has to come. It has to bring forth. This is what the Lord was saying. It's not that he doesn't want you. I'm, I said, you know, he wants you, but he wants you to come in unity. If you don't come in unity, you're going to cause division. That's why he doesn't want division. This is what it's about. So if you don't come, that doesn't bother him a bit. It bothers people. I've heard people say, oh, man, we can't get anybody to come to the prayer group. Well, the problem is they probably didn't need to be there anyway because they didn't want to be there, and they would have caused a division. So if you want to be here, be here. If you don't want to be here, don't be here. Nobody's going to be upset, or at least I'm not going to be upset. I'm going to praise God that you're doing what you're supposed to do, and I'm not going to have any problems with that. If God does, he has to talk to you because he can talk to you. He can put it right down there and tell you exactly what's going on. One of the things that I'm going to say also was this. It's about the anointing. We have learned that we were down in Fairfield, Iowa. I think I've told this before, but we went down there when we first got into World Ministry Fellowship, they had a three-day revival. 
and the anointing was strong. Music was awesome. Teaching was fantastic. But in the music, they always had people dancing and singing. They had this one guy, he got down on his kind of his haunches and went around like this, like he was doing an Indian dance. It was amazing. Just tremendous understanding what was happening. We had several people from this area down there at that time, and they were amazed too, and they learned. And the very last, uh, very last night of the meeting, B.B. Uh, Rail, which was uh, the pastor of the church, and her husband, Larry, invited us up to, pre to pray for people at the front of the church. So we brought, came up there and we started praying and everybody fell out. Whoever we prayed for fell out. Now I've had that happen before and I said, Lord, I've had people actually grab a hold of you and try to push you down. Grab your hand and shoulder and Ear! as they're praying, I'm saying, I'll never do that. I mean, if you don't go down, they'll push you harder. Because they want you down. They don't want God to move. They want to make it happen. And that's what people get upset with once in a while. I didn't put my hand on you, but I'll touch you. But all of a sudden, if God wants you down, he'll, go, he'll take you down. I, I got that attitude. So I hadn't had anybody going down at church. Prayed on the prayer team. And we came back. And every person I prayed for was down on the ground. Got slain in the spirit. Just boom, 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 boom. Got a call from our system pastor. Said, would you please move over to the right side of the church because it's disturbing when the t pastor goes into teaching they're still laying on the floor. Well, they got slain in the spirit over there too. For about a month afterwards. After a month, nobody ever got slain in the spirit. I said, what's happening? Why did it change so dramatically? And the Lord started to show me you came under their authority, their anointing. So what happened was, whenever you did what you did, you were doing it through their anointing, not your anointing. I says, huh? So I had to start to learn about anointings. We've been down, talked with Pastor Thurman when he was here. He says, yeah, he says, we have people down here. He talked about two or three different people that were at the healing service or center. They talk on the phone and they would have people healed. Boom. Immediately. And all of a sudden they left. And when they left they did the exact same thing. And guess what? It did not work. They couldn't get anybody healed. Saying the exact same words, doing the exact same thing, and it really upset them. But they didn't have the understanding. It was Thurman's anointing they were walking in. Without his anointing, you cannot do what he was doing. Because he took the time to seek the Lord, find out about the Lord, Find out about the word. He got the wisdom, the revelation, and the anointing of the word on him, and he was walking in what God wanted him to do. It was his anointing. People say, oh, bring the anointing. I want to go to the anointing. People go to the anointing. They go over there, and they get so excited about the anointing. It's only going to last so long. Because it's not your anointing. You have an anointing. If you want to seek the Lord, if you want to pray, if you want to learn, if you want to get down to that place, that's how you get anointed. It's your anointing. Nobody can take it away from you. When you start to pray and seek and do, it's going to happen. And you'll say, hmm, this is great. And you go to the next place, it'll do the same thing. And the next place, it'll do the same thing. But if you're underneath an anointing, like we were there that time, and I was walking an anointing already, so it had a legal right to jump on me because I knew enough to be able to do these things, and I was doing the same thing, but with their anointing on top of me, and people were falling all over the place. People were still getting healed, set free, and delivered, even without being slain in the spirit. That's my anointing. But their anointing was everybody's getting slain in the spirit. This is one of the things you have to be very careful as this anointing comes in. You're going to see things happening here. People are going to leave and try to go here, and it won't work. I remember 
Also, they said when the people, pastors all over the United States were going flocking over to Korea to Cho's church, it was so good. It was awesome. Many people were getting saved. Things were happening. We just got to go see what he's doing. He went. They went. They were there. They seen. They wanted. Oh, this is so good. They came back and decided to do the same thing in their church or tried because it didn't work. Why? It was his anointing. It was his understanding. He had a vision. They didn't have a vision. They just wanted to use his vision in their area that they're doing because they didn't have the vision. He says two visions become double vision or it's di you're divided. Two visions will divide you. So what happens when they came back and they were trying to do his vision and they had their vision it eventually just broke apart and went down. This is the other thing that you run into. So be very careful. It won't work. The two won't work together. You have to learn. I'm just telling you right now, this is a warning of knowing and this is what the Lord has been showing me. Do not try to take somebody else's anointing and when it falls on you, start to live in it because you're going to be discouraged. Get your own anointing. Seek the Lord. Find out what's happening. Have the relationship that you need with him so that the anointing of God will flow through you and you will achieve what you need to achieve. One thing, last thing about the wineskin. In other words, Jesus did not come to destroy the law. He came to complete it. The Pharisees, the old wineskin, with new wineskin was poured in. The wineskin would break apart and the wine wasted. Jesus, however, brought freedom in grace. His grace could not be held in legalistic rules that the Pharisees enforced over others. And that's what you'll find out in denominations. It's what they believe. It's how they believe. This You have to do this. You have to do that. If you get out of that and, and God wants you to do something, it'll, it won't work. And you try to get that and put that in what they've got, it won't, it'll break apart. You cannot alter Jesus to fit other molds of religion. You cannot alter Jesus to fit other molds of religion. We have to remember that we are the clay. He is the potter. He will shape us to learn to try to fit Jesus' teaching of love and freedom into a religious legalism would have a result in busting traditions and pieces of love and freedom spilled out all over the floor. It won't because the religious part will come in and break what you've got and you'll lose the new wine. That's exactly what happened to my friend, my, my uh, cousin's husband. He had the new wine. He was going crazy, but he put it in the old religious wineskin. And when it happened, it broke. He lost it, and he almost lost his life because of it. So I want you to be very careful when the anointing comes in. When you're praying, send the anointing, know what you're doing. Most people, when they said, I want revival, have no clue what's going to happen when the Bible, revival comes. You'd be surprised. It'll wipe you out. It'll cause you problems. It's not the purpose of it. Because we have the wrong concepts sometimes about what the anointing is going to do. The anointing is here to, to break yokes. I asked the Lord once, one time. I said, Lord, why do revivals last five to seven years and then they're gone? He said, the reason I pour the revival out is because my people are asking the purpose of the revival is this. To break the yoke. Old Testament says, in the anointing, yokes are destroyed. What is the yoke? The teachings, the hurts, the pains, all those things. He says, but under the anointing, I will teach them and train them and get them to where they need to be. But the problem is, when you get an anointing, you don't have to do anything. You just sit there... Ah. 
I'm enjoying it. It's so nice. It's refreshing. If you've ever been an anointing, it's just like, wow, it's fantastic. But the thing is, it's not just for that. It's to understand and train up and learn all those things under the anointing. It'll teach you and bring you to a place of maturity. But like he was saying on the, on the mountain of God, many people didn't want to climb to the next level. They just want to sit there on the level because it's, it's safe, it feels good, and that's what happens. If you can stay there, God will let you. He'll give you your sovereign. You can do what you want, and he'll accept you for that way. When you get to heaven, you might have to go through a whole new course to learn all this stuff before you get it to go into the heavenly places because you'll have a, the salvation or you'll have the, the garment of, of uh, salvation and not the robe of righteousness. As I, And I'm going by a, a vision that uh, Jesse Duplantis said that when he was there, he seen like a gondola that came up and took him there. And when he got up there, he said people walked out. He says the people came out. One guy came out and kissed the ground and said, I made it, I made it, I made it. And that's pretty wild. <laughs> so he was happy he got there. But he had a gown of salvation. So what happened? They take him over and they put him in this group over here and they start teaching them everything they never learned here. Some of these people just got saved. Just made it. They have to learn things. Then he says other people came out of that gondola and they had the robe of righteousness. They had maturity. They've, they've been with the Lord on this earth. They've learned. They've understood. And they immediately walked right into the throne room of God. It's something to think about. Ask God. He'll tell you what's going on. We love each and every one of you. I'm not trying to hurt you. But I would say after what I just heard, if you start hearing somebody teaching, whether me or somebody else about the cross, you better be saying, praise God, hallelujah, let's get this thing going. We thank you, Father, because he's expecting us to act just like, you know, if we start acting like, we had a football game here, and somebody just won or had a touchdown, and, and it, it will change that. Because one of the things he did say, and I forgot about it till just now, he says, what do you think happened after the disciples got filled with the Holy Ghost? They all went down, and they just sat there and said, okay, you know, this happened over here. That No, they were screaming to the top of their lungs. They were praying out loud in the Holy Ghost. Why? People from all over was hearing them, thinking they were drunk. They got out. They were probably walking around, bouncing, all kinds of good things, speaking about the God and the Holy Spirit and all the stuff that they're learning. Why? Because they were getting people saved daily. Why? People were excited. Now we have a problem. Too many people are so rigidly religitized in this area and, and people that have been around churches, they, they just call you nuts. I don't care. Holy Ghost hits them. They'll change. They'll want it. That's what about. They're looking for the, the, the love of God, which is through the Holy Spirit. And if we start to be that ability to do that, and that's what I said to the Lord. When the Lord told me that, I've seen people out there running around just telling people about the Holy Ghost. And he said this, go tell it on the mountain. Everybody, you are around. You need to get excited. What did the disciple do after Jesus left and filled by the Holy Spirit? We need to re-energize. It's a season to re-energize. Get up and scout and shout and scream and go crazy and be blessed and happy like we've never been happy before. That's from right from the throne room of God through the prayer on Thursday. The Lord showed me. Like I said, I want to make sure you totally understand I'm not coming against you. I'm not saying anything bad about anybody. This is what the Lord is wanting us to do. Let's get so excited that people want to have what we've got. So I just give it to the Lord and you to do as the Lord tells you to do, and we'll go from there. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise you, we worship you, we thank you, we give you glory, and we ask, Father, that you move mightily upon your children. Father, we know this is a season that the world is falling apart, and we know that your spirit is here, and things are going to happen. That things are going to get worse before they get better. We under believe that. We don't want it, but that's just what's been happening because people have to be so desperate.
for you that they'll turn quickly to receive you in the name of Jesus. We give you full glory, honor, and praise. We worship and keep each and everyone safe until we meet again in the name of Jesus. Amen.